Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as the director of the library here in Ann Arbor and the museum in Grand Rapids. We're very glad to chose you, uh, that you chose to come here on a pre-spring evening. <laughs> As with most of our programs, tonight's session is possible only through the support of the Ford Presidential Foundation, and I'm very pleased that the executive director, Joe Calvaruso, and his wife, Donna, are here tonight. Joe and Donna, do you want to take a bow? Tonight's distinguished speaker, Benton Becker, spoke twice at the Ford Museum in 2007 in conjunction with two of our feature exhibits. We invited him back to speak last fall here at the library in conjunction with the 35th anniversary of President Ford's ascendance to the presidency. However, scheduling challenges caused us to postpone the event until this evening. Professor Benton Becker has impeccable credentials as an eyewitness to two critical events in our nation's recent history. First, following the resignation of Spiro Agnew in 1973, he served as President Ford's, or then Congressman Ford's, lead counsel during the confirmation hearings before the Senate Rules Committee and the House Judiciary Committee uh, at that time to become Vice President. This was the first time in our nation's history and the only time that the 25th Amendment to the Constitution was implemented since it had been ratified in 1967. Given the stress surrounding the resignation and the appointment procedures, Professor Becker's strong constitutional law experience was invaluable throughout this process. The second event at which our speaker was an eyewitness involved the very difficult decision that President Ford had to make with regard to considering a pardon for, Pres for Richard Nixon and the subsequent battle over Nixon's papers and the famous tapes. Talk about being at the epicenter of two constitutional crises back to back. Professor Becker has had a very diverse and distinguished career as an attorney in both government service and private practice, as well as being a highly respected and sought after teacher and lecturer in the area of constitutional law. He earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Maryland and his JD from American University. He has been a faculty member in law and political science at the University of Miami and is currently on the law faculty of St. Thomas University Law School at Fort Lauderdale. He also serves as a trustee of the Ford Presidential Foundation and has done so since 2003. Professor Becker's legal experience began with the U.S. Department of Justice Criminal Division, where he was involved in government cases against Congressman Adam Clayton Powell and other white-collar prosecutions. During that period, Professor Becker became acquainted with Congressman Gerald Ford, at that time the minority leader in the House. After moving from government to private practice, Congressman Ford was among the first clients to contact him for legal counsel. During President Nixon's first term as president, the two men had a professional lawyer-client relationship. This relationship grew more close during the confirmation hearings for the vice presidency and later increased to weekly meetings throughout the vice presidency as Ford sought counsel on various matters independent from directives from the Nixon White House. When President Richard Nixon's presidency began to crumble after Watergate, Professor Becker served as special counsel to President Ford and assisted with the transition in power. He then played a key role personally representing the new Ford White House in the negotiations regarding the possible pardon of Nixon and the waiver of his ownership claim to records and tapes from that administration. Unlike journalists or commentators on the outside who are often our speakers here, Benton Becker has truly a unique perspective from the inside regarding the first 100 days of the Ford administration. It's a great honor to be able to welcome a longtime friend of President Ford and a wonderful supporter of the Ford Library and Museum to our podium. Please welcome Professor Benton Becker. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely to be here. I always enjoy coming to Michigan and uh, visiting with uh, the library or the museum and the old friends. And tonight we're going to talk about the first 100 days of the Ford administration. I'll try not to bore you. The first day of the Ford administration was like, unlike any other day of any other president's administration. There were 24 hours, a total of 24 hours notice 
to President Ford and to his staff that uh, there would be a transition between President Nixon and the Vice President. So 24 hours he had to, to organize what he was planning to do for the next three, and a, three years, almost three, four years. The White House scene where, all, where people were gathered that morning, some of you will remember Richard Nixon walking with Pat Nixon to the helicopter, boarding the helicopter and going to uh, Andrews Air Force Base and then boarding a plane and going out to their home in San Clemente, California. President Ford and Mrs. Ford, Vice, then, then Vice President Ford and Mrs. Ford uh, walked with President Nixon and Pat and walked abreast, not at traditionally that the vice president walks three or four steps behind the president, but uh, abreast, demonstrating their, their soon to be established equality. This was about 11.30 in the morning uh, on uh, August 8th, uh, 73, when um, this all occurred. And President Nixon had signed the night before a document addressed to Henry Kissinger uh, indicating that at 12 noon on August 8th, I will be uh, uh, resigning from the presidency, which meant that the, the, em the empty spot in the presidency as of that moment in time had to be filled by uh, the next uh, in line pre uh, president, uh, Vice President Ford. And we moved directly from this session or the helicopter and the takeoff of the helicopter directly from this session into the White House, and we have some shots of that, where President Ford was met by family members and some of the ranking officials in Washington in the government and took the oath of office at that time. That's where he made his, in effect, his uh, acceptance speech to the office of the presidency and with lines uh, such as, you may recall, I am a Ford, not a Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I believe that truth is the glue that holds government together. Those are the lines in the front row you see there, the four children. When he left that podium that day, he wandered, we wandered back to the White House, uh, or to other rooms in the White House, and then President Ford walked into the uh, Oval Office of Richard Nixon, uh, had been Richard Nixon's Oval Office, and this is the very first time, this photo is the very first time President Ford was in the Oval Office at, as president, as president. You'll note that uh, the bookshelves are empty in the background. This was President Nixon's office, uh, and had no, no change of decor, decor had occurred. On the lower level, you see there's an embossed presidential seal. Uh, those kind of things were removed. This is Don Rumsfeld, uh, closest to me, and I'm on the other side there. Um, we were... Uh, we met immediately after the swearing in, we three, and uh, discussed uh, the schedule that had been worked out the night before, but what we're gonna do what, the rest of the day. And the president had quite a schedule, the new president had quite a schedule. He uh, was going to meet with uh, people from all uh, different categories of uh, international politics. He met with some ambassadors, Later that, after, that, that afternoon, he met with the uh, cabinet. He met with senior officers of the White House. Uh, he, he met with almost everyone that he could that very first day. One meeting after the next, after the next, reassuring uh, that the government is proceeding and going on without any, any hitch at all. It was a long day. It was a very long day. And when it was over, uh, we had to all go home and change our shirts and our clothes because there was a little bit of a party of something that night. It wasn't, it wasn't an inaugural event because we didn't want it to appear to be an inaugural event. Uh, it was a, just a, a celebration of sorts representing uh, respect to the new president and his family. A small number of people were present, uh, maybe 100, 150 people, senior officials in Washington and others. Um, and it didn't last long. It was a short evening, uh, opportunity to say hello to the president and so forth. The, um, but one, one could discern, if you took a step back at that, at that meeting or at that, that evening's event, one could discern 
there was a great sense of relief in the air. No one articulated it, but there was a great sense of relief that the executive branch of the federal government was no longer at war with the congressional branch, and that the executive branch was no longer at war with the judicial branch, and that once again, the three co-equal branches that our founding fathers had established were working together again. And there was a, a sense of happiness about that. And that was, that was day one. There were lots of other days to follow, and as the days went on, the president's task grew. Now, when I was asked to, to talk about the first 100 days, the, um, the first impression I had was I'd like to try to place into context those items, those matters, those concerns that took the time of President Ford during that first 100 days. Where, where was his time devoted? What, what did he focus his attention on as president? That doesn't mean for the remaining uh, 900 other days of his administration that there was the same focus, but this was the focus on the first 90 days. And I'll, I've broken that down into five different categories, and I'll, I'll walk you through each one and tell you what, so what some of the concerns were and how they were handled. And that, they're not necessarily in this order, uh, and they certainly are not necessarily in terms of the amount of hours of the President's day were used for each of these. But the first concern was, cle was clearly foreign matters, foreign affairs and international relations. The uh, President, of course, was delighted with uh, Henry Kissinger as the Secretary of State uh, and leaned heavily on uh, Secretary Kissinger and, and thought the world of Secretary Kissinger in terms of his gross, great knowledge of what the international scene. But there was a concern from the last four to five months of the Nixon administration. There had been focus, quite frankly, only on the impeachment propositions uh, pending in the uh, House of Representatives and the committees, and President Nixon and his staff had simply ignored international matters and, in great measure, domestic matters during that time period. And there was a, a lot uh, to be uh, addressed at that point in time. The worst part of it was that some of the European press and some of the Middle East press had began at the, in the closing months of the Nixon administration to characterize the United States of America as, quote, weak and leaderless, unquote. The leaderless characterization was based on Richard Nixon's non-addressing of these to the issues of, of uh, international concern. By, by, by any means, President Ford's primary concern on the international scene was to change that posture, to show the world and each nation one at a time if necessary that this, the United States is not a weak nation, the United States is a strong nation, and the United States seeks to, to go forward with its plans uh, in an international manner. It will carry out, it will carry out its duties, uh, as a great power and will continue to do so. Um, toward that end, the President met with uh, Premier uh, Brezhnev uh, in, within the first 90 days of his administration in the Soviet Union to discuss the, the diminution of uh, offensive nuclear weapons, and first steps were taken toward that task. This was a this was done before 90 days were completed in the first administration, in the first uh, days of his administration. He had different views on some subjects and was open to consideration of a lot of them. With respect to China, he had been to China uh, following President Nixon's opening of China with Hugh Scott and other congressionals. Uh, representatives and had, was very impressed with China and impressed with the, the technology and felt that China was a nation that was going to be growing and growing in the next, next century and in the next decades that, that would follow. Toward that end, he sought to make plans to make China, to have China a good partner, a good economic trading partner with the United States. Uh, that was a, a goal. But by all means, by all means, his primary concern was to disestablish any thought of any country that the United States was weakened by President Nixon's uh, uh, resignation and that the United States was adrift without any leadership. 
That was not the case. The United States was not adrift. This man was here and was taking charge and was moving forward with it. And so the international concern was a uh, great toward him, and he spent a great deal of time on that. Domestically, number two, he had concerns with what was going on domestically. He had been harboring for some time uh, some serious, serious consequences based on the federal deficit and the yearly federal de deficit and overspending by Congress every year of more money than what was coming in and the deficit increasing and increasing and increasing. And there was so much that he could do as a congressman about that. He had to, he had to satisfy his district to, to some extent with some kinds of uh, perks. But he felt that the, it had gotten far, far out of hand with respect to the Congress. Uh, and this is, I'm talking about the year 1974. I'm not talking about 2009. I'm talking about 1974. I can imagine what, how, what he would have to say about this today. But and he, he was uh, very concerned about that and very upset about that. And he felt that as president, as president, he can do something about it besides talk about it. And what he could do about that would be to exercise his veto power. And President Ford served a little bit less than nine, uh, than 1,000 days in the presidency, a little bit less than three years in, in the presidency. During that time, he vetoed over 50, 55 separate bills of Congress, 55 separate bills. On a pro rata basis between President Ford's number of vetoes and the number of bills submitted to him uh, and the number of days he was there, they, he is far ahead of any other president. The vetoes were there primarily for purposes of cutting back on spending. Federal spending uh, was excessive and he wanted it to stop and he didn't think too highly of the uh, accounting uh, methods that were being employed to kind of disguise and hide that. Now, concurrently, domestically, he found that he was, he was of a mind to believe that, and he represented the Congress in a State of the Union address, of a mind to believe that the election process every two years in the House of Representatives um, and one-third of the Senate uh, had become intolerably expensive, intolerably expensive, and that huge amounts of money were being used for, for, for that, and the monies that were being spent were not necessarily going to the aid and the assistance of the, uh, the, the congressmen and the senators that were running on an educational basis for the, uh, for the voters. The voters didn't seem to be any more educated then than when President Ford ran for Congress for the first time in 1948. In fact, if anything, they were, they were just slogans that voters were getting in these later years based on all the money being spent. And he was quite concerned with that, and then uh, as the presidential level too. Now, there had been some, some legislation of sorts that was enacted following Watergate that tried to put some muscle into federal leg legislation with respect to campaign financing. And for the very first time, the, there was a, a limitation placed, an, a real limitation placed on the amount of contribution that an individual could give to a senator or to a congressman or any federal office. And that was originally $1,000. Uh, and the, but that campaign finance law was pending in the courts and there was a lot of concern that parts of it were going to be found unconstitutional. And indeed, a number of case portions of that, that law were found to be null and void and simply unconstitutional. And the campaign finance laws were affecting uh, na uh, federal uh, campaign uh, offices were, uh, were in a state of flux. The law had been just truncated in such a way that the end product of what survived the constitutional inquiry was uh, nothing that Congress had in mind. President Ford began to come to a conclusion and began to tell us about his conclusions that it just isn't fun anymore. It used to be a lot of fun to be a congressman and to make speeches and argue with your colleagues and uh, debate this subject and, and do it harsh and strong and in a powerful way and then go out that night and, and play poker with the, the guy you were yelling at all day uh, or play golf the next day. That was, a, that was fun. But today, today, and today being 1974, he found he, the, that there was too much partisanship in, in Congress and that the partisanship had become 
had overridden the concern sometimes for the voters and uh, for the good of the country. Just a quick note on some domestic items of President Ford. Uh, they, uh, that occurred, uh, they were uh, his GNP, gross national product, increased 10% during his administration. He put almost four million new jobs into place. And he, and he cut the inflation rate by over 50% during his, during his presidency. These are, these are some of the, the concepts that, uh, that he did. And in, a and in a typical Gerald Ford approach, uh, one that says, don't run away from conflict, face it head on. President Ford, in the first 100 days of his administration, went to the a, a, a Veterans of Foreign War Convention. Veterans of Foreign War Convention. And he took that occasion at that time before that audience to let that, to let that audience know that uh, he had uh, come to a, an amnesty an, a deal uh, conclusion with the draft dodgers from that had flown to California, and there would not be criminal prosecution. There would be alternative approaches. So his, his feeling about Congress was so strong that uh, he, he yearned for the day, incidentally, as all presidents yearn for, uh, to have what is known as a line item veto. Presidents get bills from Congress and they either accept it in total or reject it in total. There is no middle ground. As long as going back to Abraham Lincoln, presidents sought for and wished they could get what some governors have in this country, a line item veto, where you could veto one item out of, the, out of a bill or one paragraph or one sentence and leave the rest. Never got it, never got it. No president's ever really had a line item veto fully. Um, and uh, if he had a line item veto, he would have done a lot more vetoing, I suspect, because sometimes you just have to sign a bill for, for reasons of economic purposes or otherwise. Some, this bill has to be signed, yet it's got a bridge to nowhere provision on the lower uh, 17th page in one paragraph coming out of nowhere, and some congressman has placed that in for his constituency. In, uh, 30 years later, rather articulately, President Ford said this about that. He said, there are so much partisan uh, advantage being sought in political elections and always at the expense of the uh, public policy. He said, quote, at times it feels as if American po uh, political, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the American politics consists largely of candidates without uh, ideas uh, who hire, who hire uh, consultants without convictions who then engage events without any purpose. To, to the end, to the end result of which is there are elections without voters, as actually speaking. So uh, this is uh, some of the things that he focused on domestically uh, during his uh, uh, the early days of his presidency. Oh. So we've talked about two of a major, con major concern that took most of his time, the matters of international concern and the matters of domestic concern. The third was President Ford considered the question of having his own team, his own team, a team uh, both in a cabinet position and in the senior staff at the White House. His own team, uh, President Ford had 24 hours of transition time he had the same notice that everybody in the country had had of uh, Richard Nixon's intent to, to resign 24 hours later. Uh, he had no advanced time period there. And he, uh, he walked into office 
into the Oval Office and he was surrounded by people who had been in Richard Nixon's White House, Richard Nixon's cabinet. And being a team player, as he always was all his life, he felt that it would have been an inappropriate for him to punish someone by not retaining that individual in some position of government uh, simply because they happened to work for Richard Nixon. And so the concept initially of, of having your own team was, was, an, was not embraced by President Ford, but within 30 days or 45 days of, of the new administration, two events occurred that changed his mind. One event was commonly referred to as the burn bag incident where the Secret Service reported that the senior staff at the White House who had senior staff had a trash can and a, another kind of trash can that's called a burn bag. There's a bag in it. And the, every time you throw away a piece of paper, if you're a senior staff member, you have to make a decision. Does it go into a regular trash can that goes through normal trash delivery, or does it go into the burn bag where it's destroyed? It's chemically burned. Well, the Secret Service informed us that the burn bags in the first two weeks of the Ford administration, the senior staff at the White House had almost tripled the amount of work. And the, the, the feeling was, of course, people are beginning to get rid of documents and throwing away documents, and, and we, we, we have to stop that. The other, the other was, within 48 hours after Richard Nixon's plane landed in San Clemente, California, uh, on, on the, the date of the, the first day, uh, Richard Nixon picked up the telephone and called and spoke to his chief of staff that, we, that the Ford administration had, had, had inherited, uh, uh, General Alexander Haig. And Richard Nixon told General Haig on that occasion that there are approximately 1,000 boxes, boxes almost as big as this podium, almost 1,000 boxes in the executive office building that have been box sealed and, tight and uh, are ready for transportation, put those boxes in a, um, uh, a truck and send them to Andrews Air Force Base and send them out here to San Clemente. Those boxes contain, those boxes contain all of the records and all of the papers and all of the tape recordings that were accumulated during the Nixon administration. Those boxes were so heavy that the Secret Service had actually uh, expressed some feelings uh, about uh, the floor being able to, to uh, hold those boxes. Well, we, had went, uh, we, we got, some of us got wind of this and reported it to the President that this was being, uh, that this call came in and President Ford immediately issued a statement to uh, the entire White House staff that absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing leaves the White House for San Clemente. Uh, particularly, none of those boxes with the records, papers, and tapes. President Ford then <clears throat> did a, a prudent uh, step. He asked the Department of Justice to give him a legal opinion with respect to who owns these records, papers, and tapes. Were they the property of the United States government? Or, alternatively, were they the property of Richard Nixon? Department of Justice was then uh, the Department of Justice that President Ford inherited from Richard Nixon with Richard Nixon's fifth, count them, five in five years, fifth Attorney General, Bill, Bill Saxby. And I'll in, in about a week, a, two, a week and a half, two weeks, that opinion came back. I'll talk about that in a later. But while that was pending, while that pen, opinion was pending, and while the, the memo that has been sent out by the President that there's to be no movement at all, of any records, papers, and tapes, one afternoon, actually about four days after the, uh, the President's order went out, four days afterwards, uh, walking from the executive office building to the White House in a little parking area between, I noticed uh, a truck packing boxes. And I recognized the boxes as being the boxes in the executive office building. And when I asked the uh, colonel who was supervising the uh, packing of the boxes, he told me that he had gotten his orders from the Chief of Staff, uh, Alexander Haig. We called in, I reported all of this to, to the President, and the President brought in Mr. Haig, and Mr. Haig uh, told the President that it was a mistake, I didn't, he, didn't, he didn't issue that order, and the boxes were not sent. 
But those two events, those two events led the president to believe, and I think accurately, that it was time for Jerry Ford to have his own team. And he ought to be thinking about some people on his own team that uh, were loyal to Gerald Ford and that when opinions were given to the president by senior staff, you didn't have to look beyond that opinion. Is this an opinion that's being given in the best interest of Richard Nixon or is it an opinion in the best interest of the nation? You, you could trust that it was being given uh, if you had your own team that was uh, done that way. And toward that end, he, he did some hiring and did some changes. And let me tell you a little bit about that. Made changes in so many positions, not state, not with Henry Kissinger, but he made changes in the Department of Justice by bringing in Ed Levy from the University of Chicago. He made changes in the Department of Defense by uh, asking Jim uh, Schlesinger to leave, and uh, Don Rumsfeld eventually became our Secretary of Defense. Made changes in the, the um, Chief of Staff with uh, Al Haig being removed and Dick Cheney coming in as uh, that, in that position. I don't want to forget others because at the next meeting of the, the Ford Foundation, Carla Hills will say, why didn't you mention my name? <laughs> Carla. Carla was, was uh, house, Housing and Urban Development. That was a change. And of course, one of my favorite was Bill Coleman, who became our Secretary of Transportation. Bill Coleman uh, has a, a, a notation on his resume that any lawyer in the world would love to have co-counsel with Thurgood Marshall in Brown versus the Board of Education. Not a bad notation on a resume. And so the, there was a change made on, at the cabinet level. Changes were made at the, uh, um, at the uh, White House senior staff level. And people were brought in. People like, like Phil Buchan were brought in, uh, the president's former law partner uh, that, in Grand Rapids. As, as White House counsel. Phil was someone that the president had known for years, trusted implicitly, and was always very wise in his advice. And so the president now had a very comfort level with Phil Buchan and some of the other new members that were on the team. Well, another member on the team that I should mention quickly is Jerry Terhorse. Jerry Terhorse uh, was uh, a Grand Rapids journalist, I, as I recall, and uh, was asked by the president to serve as the press secretary. And it, he, he accepted that position, and we'll have more about that in a few, uh, as time goes by, as I uh, discuss. All right. <clears throat> so let me review. Firstly, foreign matters, domestic matters, changing the team. Number four, number four. The president used to refer to this, this obligation as, quote, my constitutional obligation, unquote. He had a constitutional obligation to do something about the vacancy in the office of vice president. There was a vacancy because the former vice president, Gerald Ford, had been elevated to the presidency, leaving a vacancy in the, in the office. It happened that four or five years earlier, 67, the 25th Amendment to the Constitution had been ratified. And that means uh, th three-fourths of the states had agreed to it. Uh, after two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate had agreed to it. And the 25th Amendment generally uh, attributed to being written by former Senator Birch Bayh. The 25th Amendment provided, had two major provisions. One provision was that the disability provision and what happens with the president is disabled and they get, the cabinet can vote and very complicated procedure whereby uh, the vice president becomes the acting president for a period of the disability until the disability ceases to exist. That uh, we have never had an opportunity to use that and we're thankful for that. That no president has ever been disabled uh, formally in that way to, to go through the procedures of the 25th Amendment. The second part of the 25th Amendment provided that when there is a vacancy in the office of vice president, the president could nominate someone to be the vice president. That individual who was the nominee would become the vice president upon confirmation by both the Senate and the House. It's the only time in the Constitution that the House of Representatives participates in any confirmation proceedings. Now, that all had happened. That had happened in uh, uh, 1973 with Agnew's resignation uh, when 
the 25th Amendment was applicable, and Richard Nixon appointed Congressman Gerald Ford to be vice president, and Gerald Ford had to go through the procedures uh, laid out in the 25th Amendment with respect to seeking confirmation from the House and by the Senate. It was an arduous process as the subject of another conversation, certainly not the first 100 days of his presidency. But I will just leave you with this one thought. One of the things that Congressman Ford had to go through in the confirmation proceedings to be vice president is that he had to appear, as Elaine has told you, uh, before a committee of the House of Representatives. And that was the House Judiciary Committee. And, the House, and answer questions uh, asked uh, of him by members of the House Judiciary Committee. Ironically, ironically, history played a little joke on us, and the House Judiciary Committee that addressed the confirmation of the Vice President, Gerald Ford, to be, to be Vice President, was the very same committee of the House of Representatives at that very same time that was, in, uh, that was um, considering impeachment proceedings against the man that nominated Gerald Ford. So it was, there was some hostility uh, in, in his procedures. But President Ford didn't anticipate that in filling the vacancy that he had uh, uh, left open to him. And he had a lot of people that were interested in the job. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a job that uh, people run away from anymore, the vice presidency. And there were people that were interested, but I'm going to tell you only the names of the people that President Ford was interested in. Uh, and um, the, so some of these people, it's not that they were not qualified, and it's not that President Ford didn't think highly of them, but the, the fact of the matter is President Ford had other plans for some of these people, and it just didn't fit in with these people becoming vice president. They had other plans for him. For example, George Bush Sr was a longtime friend of the president's, and he had a high regard for George Bush Sr. George Bush Sr. would have liked to have been vice president. We had every reason to believe that. But the president had other plans for him. He saw him as a future director of the Central Intelligence Agency, which George Bush occupied that position. And he saw him as well as our, the United States envoy to the People's Republic of China. Even though we had no diplomatic relations, we could have envoys, and George Bush would be a wonderful first step. So George Bush was uh, not uh, 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 selected. He also uh, considered Bob Dole uh, with a lot of seriousness. And as you know, in 1976 at the convention, uh, for a re election, uh, President Ford selected Bob Dole as his running mate. But uh, back in 74, when there was a vacancy and the 25th Amendment was being considered, Bob Dole's vote in the Senate, Bob Dole's leadership in the Senate, was considered so critical that it couldn't do without him. Donald Rumsfeld had come all the way from Brussels as the um, Na our NATO ambassador to attend the swearing in of President Ford at President Ford's invitation. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld was a colleague of President Ford's during his congressional years and, and, and an important colleague during the battling years when President Ford became the minority leader, this, taking the position away from Charlie Halleck. And so Donald Rumsfeld and President Ford had a good deal in common and a, a long history. But again, I think President Ford foresaw early that Donald Rumsfeld was, is going to take an uh, important position in my administration, but that position is not vice president. He's going to take another position. And as he, took, he became the Secretary of, of Defense. Donald Rumsfeld came to the swearing in, as I said, and brought with him, incidentally, brought with him a young man. I was 36, but the younger than I, 34. He brought in a young man who had been an aide to, to, Rum, to Don Rumsfeld for many, many years. An aide to Rumsfeld when he was in Congress, an aide to Rumsfeld when he went to some of the agencies that Nixon had appointed him to. Well, and this aide uh, was a very bright, was and is a very bright uh, individual. And that was uh, historically one of the very first times that Don Rumsfeld's aide a young man named uh, Richard Cheney entered the White House. And uh, as you know, Don replaced 
Al Haig quickly, and we replaced Al Haig rather quickly, and Don became, in essence, acting chief of staff, but he was chief of staff, but, but he knew, and we all knew, that he wasn't going to keep that position longer. There were other things in, in the works for him, uh, defense. But during that, during that early period, uh, Don showed Dick Cheney a lot of the ropes of, of uh, the White House. And when Don left the chief of staff position and went to uh, the uh, Department of Defense, Dick Cheney became the chief of staff uh, in the Ford White House and did a, a very, very fine job at it as well. Who have I left out? Who have I left out? Oh, oh, Ann Armstrong, President Ford had consideration, wanted to consider, strongly consider a woman uh, in, in office, but found it was not the right pick. And ultimately, you know, he, re he resolved that constitutional obligation by nominating Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York. Now, Governor Rockefeller brought to the vice presidency a lot of things and, and to the Ford White House some things that were actually lacking in uh, President Ford at that time, specifically executive uh, experience. Governor Rockefeller had been governor for many, many years of a huge state with a huge budget. And President Ford had been running a congressional office for 22 years. Uh, governor Rockefeller had a uh, context of international flavor and what was going on internationally, and uh, President Ford thought that this, this would be a very fine appointment. It turned out that Governor Rockefeller turned out to be just an excellent, excellent vice president. He was a hardworking man, and to some people's surprise, the two of them, the president and vice president, got along famously. They just got along like they had been old friends for 30 years. And a lot of that had to do with the warm nature of Governor Rockefeller and his uh, delightful sense of humor. Uh, he could always get President Ford to giggle and laugh uh, when, when he needed to. I remember once he used to, he used to tell a story. This was a story that came about uh, in 76. This is after the election, after the Carter had won the election in 76, but before the inaugural. And so we were in uh, like a week before Thanksgiving in November. And the vice president, Rockefeller, said uh, he really doesn't like Thanksgiving. This is his least favorite holiday. And it was a strange remark. He said, why is that? Why is that? And, and, the, and the answer was traditional. It's an old Rockefeller chestnut. He said, oh, the, the answer was that, well, we all, the Rockefeller family all gets together for Thanksgiving. And we all sit down at the table. And one of the young members of the Rockefeller family says, before we eat, let's count our blessings. And they don't eat until mid-January. <laughs> Rocky thought that was funny. Jeff Preston Ford thought that was very funny, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was, I think it was funnier when Rockefeller told it. <laughs> All right. So finally, we have a vice president. We have our own team. We've got a handle on domestic questions. We've got a handle on foreign questions. What else? There's another big lurking problem that is taking so much of President Ford's time, taking so much of his time. And in fact, the very first press conference as president, over 90% of the questions had to do with this subject. And whenever we went on the road, we had brief, short press conferences with, with, with uh, visiting press, the, the questions would always have to do with this subject. And the questions were varied, but they were always back to the same subject. What are you going to do about Watergate? What are you going to do about Richard Nixon? Have you met with? Uh, Mitchell, Halderman, Ehrlichman, have you met with any of those people? Do you plan to pardon anyone? Do you plan to immunize anyone? What are you going to do with these people? What do you think of the change of Archibald Cox to um, uh, Leon Jaworski as the new special prosecutor? What, have you met with the special prosecutors, et cetera? Question upon question upon question, and the president's days were beginning longer and longer because of this. And the critical question, critical question, because this, had, this was known to the public from events earlier in the Ford presidency, what are you going to do, Mr. President, ultimately about this question of Nixon's records, papers, and tapes? Are you going to send them to him and give them, give them back to Nixon, or are you going to keep them a, a part of the government? Uh, who owns these tapes? 
And always President Ford answered those questions with uh, diplomatically as possible. But you could see that his time was getting broader and broader. And every, and every this, this was not his problem. Watergate was something that had to be put behind so we could move forward on other matters. Watergate was, was a, a strong weight that was holding back any real movement in the administration's forward uh, thrust diplomatically, in, internationally, or domestically. So, uh, as I said, the president had asked justice for an opinion. And the Department of Justice uh, provided that opinion to him one, one afternoon. It was about three weeks into his presidency. This man, this man who had been 20 some years a member of Congress whose entire life had been one of teamwork and being a team player. Now this man is, receives a memo from the Department of Justice that tells him the following information with respect to the ownership of the records, papers, and tapes. The memorandum is somehow or other, no one ever explained how, but somehow or other, the memorandum is concurrently given to the President of the United States and the Washington Press Corps. The memorandum says, quote, that, in essence, it says that records, papers, and tape recordings accumulated during the course of a President's administration upon that President's departure from the White House become the personal property of that president. They, this is not a matter of law, the memo makes it clear. It is a matter of custom and tradition, rather than a matter of law. Now, of course, custom and tradition notwithstanding, we never, ever, ever had a president resign before Richard Nixon. We never had a president that had uh, voice-activated tape recordings in the Oval Office and, and in the Cabinet Room and, and the Executive Office building of, of the President. We never had such, such information and tapes that are of such evidentiary value to the special prosecutor, to dozens of people that are awaiting trial, criminal trials and civil actions. Well, they, uh, n never had that before. But the memorandum made, made an accurate statement of history with respect to a number of, but not all, a number of presidents that literally took all of their records, papers, and tapes. Ulysses Grant, for example, had an auction of his papers and tapes. He, had, he was in dire need of funds. But not all presidents did. But then the front page of this memorandum contained language and a tone to the language that some of us thought was just atrocious, that some of us thought was not appropriate to address to a president, and certainly not appropriate to address to a president who had been in office only three weeks. The memorandum said, very briefly, it said, uh, okay. For you to conclude that such materials are not the property of former President Richard Nixon, uh, would, re would constitute a reversal of what has probably been an almost unvaried understanding of the three branches of government since the beginning of, of, the, of the Republic. Now, since the beginning of the Republic, there has been uh, an almost uh, pro pro uh, proposition to this thing and uh, almost unvaried. Now, furthermore, it goes on one more sentence, and it says, quote, and I want you to think about this. If you, were, if you were president of the United States, you were president of the United States, you've been president for three weeks, you, you really don't know who owns this stuff. You really don't know. Uh, and now you're told by tradition and custom and usage it belongs to the former president. And you receive the memo that says this, and the memo concludes like this. Listen to the concluding language. Furthermore, if you are to give these, uh, refuse to give these papers to President, uh, former President Nixon, 
you will call into question the practice of all former presidents since the earliest times. You will be telling Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Washington, Mr. Jefferson that they're wrong and you're right after three weeks in the presidency. Now, this is just struck me as being a very, very uh, forceful way when somebody was really trying to dictate the uh, direction of these records, papers, and tapes. It didn't take Gerald Ford long to recognize some of the argument that was going on in the Oval Office, and particularly the argument that, that said, if you send these records, papers, and tapes to Richard Nixon, A, there'll be a big bonfire out there, and B, <laughs> the historians will record, the historians will record that Jerry Ford committed the final act of the Watergate cover-up. And he understood that. He understood that. He understood that very well. He walked out of that meeting with that memorandum in hand and said, these records, papers, and tapes belong to the American people, not to Richard Nixon, and I'm not giving them back to him. And uh, those records, papers, and tapes became a serious, serious concern uh, to uh, President Ford and the administration in the, in the weeks and the months that followed. Shortly around that time, or shortly after that meeting, I was asked to attend a meeting with uh, the President and Phil Buchan, and at that meeting, I was uh, asked to uh, undertake to do some uh, legal research on s certain questions that were bothering the President. And he wanted, uh, he wanted to know, in essence, what his uh, constitutional authority was with respect to the granting of pardons. I didn't say to whom or what, but it was pretty clear we knew what he was talking about. And he was considering uh, giving a pardon uh, to Richard Nixon. And he wanted to know what his authority was. Essentially, he wanted to know is if, if a presidential pardon is given, does that prohibit a state from proceeding criminally against the person pardoned uh, under state criminal law? And the answer was, no, it does not. Presidential pardons only apply to federal crimes and do not apply to state crimes. No president give, can give a pardon for a state crime, and no governor can give a pardon for a federal crime. And the states technically do not have to pay any attention to whether or not the pardon, uh, the pardon granted by the president. They could proceed. For example, if the state of California concluded that Richard Nixon had prior knowledge or directed the break-in of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist in Los Angeles, his office, uh, if they, uh, Dr. Fielding, if they, if the state of California had evidence that Richard Nixon had any knowledge of that, which there was none, and there is no knowledge by Richard Nixon, it's pretty clear, but if they did conclude that, they could have proceeded uh, with a, uh, a burglary-type uh, uh, prosecution under state law, notwithstanding a presidential pardon. However, however, there is the concept of something called comedy, where one state, uh, one sovereign, uh, will respect the authority of another s sovereign if, they, if it is done in reverse. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of thing. And if a, if a president gives a pardon, states will, will almost without exception decline to prosecute, even though they were free to do so. To some extent, that works the other way around, too. If a state gives a pardon, then uh, the federal government will uh, cease to prosecute uh, under those circumstances as well. However, it doesn't always work that way because sometimes the state criminal statute is identical to the federal criminal statute. And if one receives, say, a pardon for a state criminal statute, such as, say, drug trafficking uh, at the state level, which is a, just a, a copy of the federal uh, statute on the same subject, the, uh, the, um, the federal government could still proceed with it if it felt that there was some corrupt influence on the pardon or corrupt influence in the, uh, in the trial at the state level. You remember, all of us in this room, I think are, so most of us are old enough to remember, in the 50s and 60s, criminal uh, homicide prosecutions to civil rights work workers in, in the South uh, uh, and prosecutions at the state level for homicide and uh, racial verdicts being returned by juries of not guilty. Well, in 1964, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the federal government stopped ignoring 
those, uh, those verdicts of not guilty and proceeded even in face of a not guilty verdict to a homicide at the state level, proceeded uh, to go forward with the uh, criminal prosecutions under the Civil Rights Act. But generally speaking, they followed one another. President Ford also wanted to know if a pardon granted by the president, did it have to specifically state what statute you're being pardoned for and or what event you're being pardoned for, this such and such event? Or could it be a general pardon? And the answer is it could be a general pardon, of course. A general pardon so were given during after the Civil War. Andy Johnson gave many, many general pardons uh, after the Civil War. And uh, they're, they're very common. You can give a pardon uh, without identifying the statute or without identifying the uh, uh, the event that, for which is being pardoned, just a time period. <sighs> President Ford also uh, wanted to know what were the procedures, what were the requirements, the constitutional requirements for a pardon. It has to be a president that is granting the pardon without bribery or corruption um, uh, for a federal offense, and the pardon had to be accepted, it had to be accepted. Pardons can be rejected. Pardons could be rejected. Par the pardon language in Article uh, 2 of the Constitution is uh, there uh, right uh, at the same place the language for commutations are in the same location where pardons are. A commutation is sort of a fancy word from the 1700s that means reduction of sentence, a reduction of sentence. So presidents can reduce the sentence of somebody who's been convicted and sentenced or, and or presidents can pardon, but they're different animals. A pardon had to be accepted. A person could refuse a pardon. On the other hand, a commutation could never be refused, and no one has a constitutional right to uh, a room at a federal penitentiary and to stay at a federal penitentiary. So as you may remember, Jimmy Hoppe's part, uh, commutation in 1972 by Richard Nixon, where we, Nixon cut something like seven years of a sentence that was still pending against Jimmy Hoppe and impose the condition that Hoppe not run for union office for another 10 years. Hoppe, initial response was, I don't want it. I don't want the commutation. Sorry, Mr. Hoppe, you must, ex you have no say so on a commutation. You're out. But a pardon, you can, you can refuse. And the history of the pardon and that, that history all was, it was fascinating to President Ford because it, it had to do with a case back in 1915 that went up to the Supreme Court of the United States named Burdick. And we, we had a lot, we talked about that case a great deal. Burdick was <clears throat> a journalist who had written a series of articles about corruption um, at the customs, uh, at customs. And customs officials were accepting bribes uh, in this local uh, jurisdiction. And uh, virtually uh, violating the criminal laws. The uh, United States attorney, the federal prosecutor in that jurisdiction, issued a grand jury subpoena to Mr. Burdick, the journalist, and brought him in to the grand jury and told Mr. Burdick, Mr. Burdick, we think the world of you. You're not a target. You're not a target of this grand jury. We think you've done good work. The grand jury wants to follow it up now with criminal prosecutions. And so, Mr. Burdick, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and we'd like you to answer those questions. Who are your sources? Who told you what? Tell us everything you've got. 1915. Mr. Burdick said, I'm not going to answer those questions. Uh, I refuse to answer on the grounds uh, my answer may tend to incriminate me or end or other, pri other pri uh, privileges. Well, Mr. Burdick was excused, and two weeks later, we received another subpoena from the grand jury, same grand jury, same U.S. attorney, walked in the same room, same 23 people in the grand jury sitting there, uh, and the same question, tell us your source. Mr. Burdick said, counsel, I'm not going to answer your questions about that. I invoke the same privileges that I did before, uh, self-incrimination and other privileges. Whereupon, the Supreme Court opinion tells us that the United States attorney reached into his pocket and pulled out a single sheet of paper and handed that single sheet of paper to Mr. Burdick. That single sheet of paper was a pardon granted to Mr. Burdick by President Wilson, pardoning him for everything that he's ever done from the moment of his birth up until that second. A complete, what the lawyers call a complete bath. And, uh, 
But with that, with that, Mr. Burdick no longer, according to the U.S. Attorney, uh, could no, no longer well, had to be any fear that his statements, his answers to the questions, could result in incriminating statements to him. Because if they did anything incriminating, this piece of paper served as a bar to any criminal prosecution. So Mr. Burdick no longer, in the eyes of the U.S. Attorney, and I think he was right, had no uh, Fifth Amendment privilege. And so Mr. Burdick was sent up to a federal judge, and the federal judge said, you answer those questions, Mr. Burdick, or I'll hold you in contempt. And they went back to the grand jury, and Mr. Burdick said, I'm not answering the questions, and he went to jail. And he went up to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Mr. Uh, <clears throat> the Supreme Court of the United States, in uh, unanimous opinion, in 1915 said, and this is still the law today, very much the law today, said, Mr. Burdick is right. Mr. Free him from that jail. Mr. Burdick is right. He does, he's not right about self-incrimination. He doesn't have a self-incrimination uh, privilege because of the, the pardon. The pardon serves as a bar to any incrimination. But Mr. Burdick is right about this. Mr. Burdick can, can refuse that pardon. And he has done so. He has refused that pardon and wants nothing to do with it. And uh, people are free to accept or reject a pardon because other than, other than the situation where an individual who has been convicted of a crime and later in a DNA or otherwise uh, it demonstrates that he, he or she is innocent, other than that incident, other than that, and that, that's not at all the case of Richard Nixon. There's no conviction and later discovery of innocence. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about cases like Richard Nixon. The Supreme Court said people can refuse a pardon or accept a pardon, but if you accept a pardon, under the circumstances I've just outlined, acceptance is an acknowledgment of guilt. Well, it was about this time that the concept of presidential pardon and records and tapes became linked. And Phil Buchan and I had been meeting with Jack Miller, who was Nixon's lawyer in Washington, and it was the two ships in the night of passing one another without seeing each other. We wanted to talk about records and tapes, and we had even drafted, or had drafted for us, a deed of trust for Mr. Nixon's signature to sign and give all the records and papers and tapes to the federal government. Uh, and we wanted to talk about that and talk about Richard Nixon's signature to that. Mr. Miller and Mr. Nixon only wanted to talk about pardons. And so we weren't getting anywhere. And Jack Miller was a fine man, was a fine man, he's now deceased. But, but uh, Jack told us, he said, you know, quite frankly, Benton, I'm not getting anywhere with Mr. Nixon via telephone from Washington to California. It might be helpful if we, we all went out to California. And so a meeting was held in the Oval Office with uh, Phil Buchan, Al Haig, myself and the president, where the consideration of being given to the deed of trust that Phil and Al and I are looking at that w would give to Richard Nixon and have, see if we could persuade Richard Nixon to sign it and give over the records, papers, and tapes. Uh, and uh, from this meeting, I would be leaving the White House and going directly to Andrews and flying out to San Clemente for that meeting. And so, uh, the meeting uh, went forward, and Al Haig predicted to us quite boldly, I will tell you, Richard Nixon will never, ever give up his records and papers and tapes. He will never give them up. So this is something of a waste of time. And uh, President Ford said, those records, papers, and tapes belong to the American people, and I'm going to see to it that they get them. And so we went out to California. We flew out to California. We arrived. In the late afternoon, Mr. Miller and I on a White House plane and uh, went directly to San Clemente uh, compound where the president was staying and began to meet uh, on the subject of records, papers, and tapes. I had three charges, three charges that I, uh, the president wanted me to do. He wanted me, one, to get Richard Nixon's signature on the, on the deed of trust. Two, he wanted me to get a statement by Richard Nixon accepting the pardon, and if possible, if possible, get Richard Nixon to acknowledge some degree of error or uh, inappropriate behavior on his, on his part. 
And thirdly, he wanted me to walk Richard Nixon through Burdick the way I walked you through it or I did with President Ford. Because President Ford made it clear that when and if a pardon was going to be granted to Richard Nixon, that that pardon, uh, the, the legality of that pardon and the legal impl uh, impact of that pardon would be the Burdick decision. And the Ford White House position with respect to that pardon would be that Richard Nixon was free to re refuse that pardon. And the Supreme Court of the United States has said over and over again, still the law, acceptance of a pardon under these circumstances is acknowledgment of guilt. And that would be the Ford White House position. And he wanted Richard Nixon to know that before there was any acceptance and to know the case rather well. So day one in San Clemente was a total bust. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Uh, they, they didn't even want to talk about records and papers and tapes. All they wanted to talk about was the pardon, the pardon, the pardon. I'm not going to talk about the pardon. And so we, we began to at least tinker a little bit with a, a hypothetical statement of acceptance. And day one was a bust. I mean, the hypothetical uh, statement of acceptance would say things like, the White House staff made terrible mistakes during Watergate. Uh, the White House people did the, uh, n n no first person, none at all. Nothing was it. Day two was very much the same way. Uh, and the end of day two, I called President Ford. But before I, I tell you about that conversation, let me tell you that uh, several years, uh, 30 years later, I was involved with, uh, representing a, a publisher and author of a Watergate book. And, we, and one of the persons interviewed was Ron Ziegler, who was in San Clemente at the time. He was acting as Richard Nixon's chief of staff out in San Clemente. And Ziegler told the author of the book that, in essence, while I was in the air flying from Washington to San Clemente, he, Ziegler, at San Clemente, received a telephone call from Haig at the White House telling Ziegler, quote, you don't have to give up the records, papers, and tapes. You'll get a pardon without it. Now, I don't know where Haig got that or, or if that was accurate. Uh, I never asked Al Haig about that. And, you know, he just recently passed on. But uh, that I can tell you that that, is, that statement is absolutely inconsistent with uh, the President's view. Uh, on the subject. Uh, he uh, was not ready to give away a pardon without the records, papers, and tapes, in my opinion. And it made it very clear to me. Uh, so because of, because of that alleged phone call from Al Haig to Ron Ziegler, we got nowhere. We got nowhere. Day one, day two, nowhere. And that night, on a secure phone, spoke to the president. I think Phil was on the line with us. And we. Uh, I told him what was going on. Of course, we didn't have any we didn't have any knowledge at that time that Al Haig may have made such a phone call. And um, the president was very upset. He was very upset. He felt that he was going out on a limb, even considering a pardon, he hadn't promised it to anybody, he was considering it, going out on a limb for this. And what was he getting in return? He was getting nothing. They won't even talk about the records and papers and tapes. They won't, they won't even uh, consider what, we're to, what, we're, what we want to do. He was very angry. I suggested, give me one more day and I'll come home. And he said, OK. He said, but I said, I, I would like to really lower the boom on him. He said, do whatever you want. Just raise, <laughs> he said, just, uh, he said, I can't, I can't imagine them being so stubborn. So the next morning, when I woke up, I called the colonel that had picked us up at the airport and taken us to the compound in San Clemente. And I told him that I was going back to Washington at 3 o'clock today, that all of these negotiations were over, and that he can ask Mr. Miller if he, Mr. Miller wants to join me, but I've had it with this, and I'm leaving. And I was in a very forceful way. And I said, I'm going to be back. I'll be over to the compound at 8.30. Uh, you, can, you can tell me about uh, what plans, what time we're leaving. Well, of course, when I got to the compound, Ziegler knew about that, and Miller knew about that. Where, where, why, why are you leaving? I said, because we're wasting our time. We're wasting our time. I talked to the president the other night, uh, last night, and this matter is a waste of time. If you won't, if you won't concede the records, papers, and tape, 
there will be no more conversation, no more conversation here in San Clemente, no more conversation at the White House in Washington, no more conversation at all about a presidential pardon. And I don't mean no more conversation today. I mean no more conversation after Mr. Nixon's indicted, because he will be indicted, uh, and, and after he's convicted. Uh, there will be no more conversation. This is it. I'm leaving, and Jack Miller said, wait, wait, wait. Let, me, let me talk to Nixon again. He went in and spoke to Nixon for about an hour and a half, as I recall. Ziegler and I were fiddling with the acceptance uh, document, and uh, Al, uh, Jack came out and he said, Can I, let me, let's let you and I talk, and we talked for about an hour, made some minor concessions. He wanted, he wanted a privilege to uh, object to certain, when a journalist sought to get the records from the federal government. He wanted to object, have the executive privilege to object to that. We wouldn't give him executive privilege. Would not give it to him. But, but language began to be clarified. And by 2 o'clock that afternoon, Jack Miller told me that the president will sign the uh, deed of trust. Well, that's fine. Well, we still had two more things that had to be done. We had to have the letter of acceptance, uh, statement of acceptance from President Nixon, and we had to have um, the, uh, the uh, uh, he, had to, he had to be versed on the Burdick decision so that he knew the White House's position, the Ford White House position. So that, uh, later that day, I went into the uh, President's office and, and I met with President Nixon. I had with me, in my hands, I had the deed of trust <clears throat> that was a grant of the records, papers, and tapes to Richard, by Richard Nixon, or claim any claim of ownership of such, to the Government uh, Services Administration, the GSA, uh, and to be signed by the administrator of the GSA. Um, and it was really a holding device. We, we looked at it as a holding device because we knew Congress was, was working out some legislation that would, would affect presidential papers. But we wanted to be have, to have this document as a holding device so that when, when and if Congress failed to act or it took Congress years to act, we still had the right to hold these. We were not going to part with those papers. So I went in there and we had, had a, a long conversation. And we talked about the records and papers and tapes and his uh, right to have copies of all the records and papers and tapes provided to him by GSA for purposes of writing his memoirs. Uh, and that uh, certain uh, privileges might, uh, of privacy might, might, under certain circumstances, be available to him uh, for journalists that, that, answered, that sought records and papers because he treated, he treated the, the tape recording in the Oval Office as if nobody in the world would ever find out about it and, the, and the, the damnedest things are said on, on those tapes. So then we got to, then we got to the question of pardon. And um, before, before which uh, Mr. Nixon signed the deed of trust. Um, and the question of pardon, I told him about Burdick, and I told him about the uh, concept that pardons could be refused and that you could refuse a pardon, but the legal effect, the legal effect of acceptance of a pardon is an acknowledgment of guilt under the circumstances of this case. The entire tenor changed when we talked about pardon. When we left deed of trust, we talked about pardon. It was as if, as if this subject matter was anxiety producing to him. He didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to talk about it. He would, he would stop me in the middle of something and say, uh, did you work in the government when I was in office? Uh, did you ever play football? Did you, they're trying to change the subject. Uh, because it was harsh. It was harsh on him to do it. Do it. And he would say things like, I never really did anything. Uh, and I said, Mr. President, I think it's anybody that's read this record knows that you had no prior knowledge of the Watergate break-in. And the, the records show that very clearly, I think. The, the records, papers, and tapes show that very clearly. But you are involved with obstruction of justice. And here's the definition of obstruction of justice. And here's the tapes. Here's a transcript of the tapes from March of 74, when you're discussing uh, a CIA uh, pay payoff uh, for the break-in of the, uh, in the, in the Watergate Hotel. And we had a little, little debate. Uh, and, uh, and we talk about 
the language that he used in the letter of acceptance. And uh, he acknowledged that his behavior was his behavior. I got rid of the White House staff did this and so that his behavior was inappropriate when the matter, the matter of Watergate, reached the judicial level. Now, let me explain that, what that means, frankly. That means that if the courts are involved, and if you're obstructing at that level while the courts are, are involved, you're involved with obstruction of justice. So if his behavior was, he used the phrase inappropriate, and if, if, his, if his behavior was inappropriate when the matter of Watergate reached, all, all everything that was called Watergate, reached uh, the judicial level, then he was acknowledging some, some measure of obstruction of justice, and particularly as, as well, if he's accepting the pardon, there's that acknowledgement. And so we parted company, we parted company. I have to tell you that when I walked into his office, I was stunned and shocked. It was an office maybe, maybe what, maybe one-fifth the size of this room. Very small, very drab almost looking. Nothing on the walls, American flag, President Nixon always in a coat and tie. Uh, and it just didn't strike me as the kind of office of a former president. It had a few chairs, uh, a small sofa, no conference table, very, very small. And uh, so anyway, I left. I left and we were going back to Washington. I had in my hand, an, I thought an acceptable statement of acceptance. I had in my hand an executed copy of the deed of trust. And um, I had satisfied myself that he fully understood the concept of acceptance of a pardon as an acknowledgement of guilt. And literally, I literally walked out of the office, Jack Miller uh, with me, and walked over to the, to the car, which was a little bit of a walk, maybe 20 yards of uh, sidewalk to, uh, from the front of the building, and literally had my hand on the door of the car and was going to get into the car to go to the airport, to get on a plane, to go back to Washington, and Ron Ziegler came running out of the building. Uh, screaming and saying, Mr. Becker, Mr. Becker, Mr. Becker, don't leave, don't leave. The president wants to see you again. The first thought that hit me was, uh, all bets are off. He's uh, changed his mind. It's got to be. I went back into the Oval Office alone again with the president. And he was standing behind his desk. And it wasn't a big desk, he was standing behind his desk. And um, <clears throat> whenever I talk about this, I get uh, all the imagery comes back to me very, very sharply. <sighs> He's standing behind his desk, and he said, um, before you left, I wanted to, to give you something, because you've been a gentleman, words of effect. And I said, that's not necessary, Mr. President. I said, no, I wanted to give you something. And then he made a gesture to me. He made a gesture as if symbolically to say, look at this room, look at this office. And he, he said, I don't have anything anymore. I took it all away. And as to say, look at this room. And then before I could even respond, he said, but Pat found these, and he reached down his desk and came up with a small box. He said, I want you to have them. He said, uh, there aren't any more. She had to get this from my, my uh, dresser drawers. He gave me a small white box which had the presidential uh, cufflinks on them with the presidential seal and his name on the back of them, favors that are usually given at state dinners or something of that effect. And, um, it was a very, very poignant moment for me, it really was. And uh, I thanked him. I said, Mr. President, what you've done with the records and papers and tapes today is a good thing for the American people. Uh, historians will enjoy this for years and years to come. I got back in the plane, I got back in the car, I went back to the plane, and flew back to Washington with Jack Miller. Went to the White House, it was Saturday night.
It was about 7 o'clock. Reported to the president, a copy of the deed, arranged, and the president decided we're going to do it tomorrow. We're going to do it tomorrow at noon. He called Jerry Terhorsen, his uh, press secretary, and said, 12 noon, get me 15 minutes, or 10 minutes, whatever I recall, with all three networks at 12 noon tomorrow. Uh, I've got an important announcement I'm going to make. Jerry DeHorse, who had not been in the know, very few White House people were on the know of what was going on in San Clemente, said, what, what's it all about? And the president said, I'll tell you, but I don't want you to tell the media. Treat it confidentially. I said, okay. He said, tomorrow at 12 noon, I'm giving Richard Nixon a pardon. And uh, my memory is that Jerry DeHorse said something to the effect of, all right, I'll, I'm going to go right away and get, get on the phone and start this right now, 12 noon. So the next morning, I was in the White House very early, about quarter of 8 or 7.30 or something. And at, at 7 o'clock, 7 a.m., there was a message from Ziegler to me. The, the, the message had to be uh, called at 4 in the morning, a, a message 7 a.m. to me. And I called back, and uh, Ziegler said, we, we've changed some of the words in the statement of acceptance. And, and he started telling me this, and look at paragraph, we've changed I to senior staff. And look, I said, Ron, we'll cancel this thing in two minutes. I'm going to call you back in five minutes. I want to hear nothing more than we've got the same letter of acceptance. Because I'm going to give it to the media today. We're going to give it to the media today. You cannot change it. Not a word. And he said, Just call me back. And I called him back, and he said, all right, we're not going to change it. We're not going to change it. But they took a shot. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, um, the uh, author Sampson, a man named Arthur Sampson, who was the administrator of GSA, came to the White House. He was the administrator, and he was the second signature uh, on the deed of trust, accepting it for the federal government. And uh, the deed of trust was, I don't know, 30, 35 pages, something of that nature, 20 pages. And um, on the staff of the White House was a very fine guy named Bill Castleman, a lawyer. And Bill had been, the, at one time, the general counsel at GSA. And Bill had a, a very important hand in writing the deed of trust that was in question. And of course, Bill would, had been general counsel of GSA while Sampson was the administrator. And Bill was with me uh, in, the, uh, all, in the White House when we, I gave this to Sampson to sign. And Bill said, I've looked at it. You can sign it. And, I, and words to the effect of, as soon as you sign it, the president would like to have a cup of coffee with you and thank you for it. So he, he signed it. And we had both signatures on the deed of trust. The president went on the air at 12 noon, announcing to the world and to the people of this country that there was a, uh, a pardon and that um, he is, uh, on that day, signing a pardon on behalf of uh, uh, Richard Nixon, the pardon was covered the period of the Nixon presidency. All acts done by President Nixon during that time period. Within, within one hour, there was an incredible firestorm, incredible firestorm. The media was just livid uh, in its criticism of President Ford. The uh, Congress had lost all sense of propriety, it seemed to me. One speech was harsher than the next and harsher than the next. And the most harsh, the most harsh, although articulate, but the most harsh, was Ted Kennedy's. Uh, he just laid into President Ford something off for the pardon. My wife and I had uh, one of our children's, our 10-year-old son's school teacher wrote us a nasty letter. <laughs> Phil Buchan, bless his soul, Phil Buchan, who had polio as a young man, uh, received the letter he showed me. He said, I, uh, I, I assume your, your brain is as twisted as your legs. It was horrible stuff, I, terrible stuff. Uh, but the pardon was executed and delivered and accepted. And it went forward. Now, I ask you to jump with me for a moment and jump from those first 100 days to about two years later, or two and a half years later, after the Carter victory in 76. 
And uh, at the inaugural, uh, at the time of the inaugural of Jimmy Carter in 77, the, um, those very same newspapers, those very same newspapers, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the very same newspapers that were so harsh on President Ford back when the pardon was issued had now come around. What a fine president he had been. And you know, he probably did the right thing. Uh, there was a total tone down of everything that went on. Now jump one more time with me to the year 2004 and the Kennedy family, Caroline and uh, Senator Kennedy, who are the trustees of this issue in the family, gave to President Ford, awarded to President Ford, a Profiles in Courage Award for his courage in giving Richard Nixon a pardon. Caroline, incidentally, wrote some years later a sequel to her father's wonderful book, Profiles in Courage, and it referred, uh, titled Profiles of Courage in Our Time. And she just picked up where her father had left off, but she wrote about other people that were living at that time. Um, and uh, how they had, ex uh, had demonstrated such courage. President Ford has a long, long chapter in that book. Ted Kennedy said on that occasion when the Profiles and Courage Award was given to, to uh, President Ford, he said, I was one of those people who spoke out against the pardon and against President Ford. But time has a way of clarifying events. And now, as we see that, uh, and, and now we see that President Ford was right and that I was wrong. Ted Kennedy, bless his soul. Uh, President Ford's courage and dedication to our country made it possible for us to begin the healing process of Watergate. We are grateful as a people to President Ford for his courage and his enlightenment. Ted Kennedy. Well, those are a quick summary of the first 100 days of the Ford administration. There were 900 other days to follow, almost 1,000 days of his presidency with very busy activities of the president. Those were days where the President of the United States daily worked to elevate and return the executive branch of government to its rightful place of prestige and pride. No President, no President ever came into office with such a lower prestige in the office of presidency than President Ford. When he left office, when he left office, the American people recognized with pride and the dignity of this man, the honesty of this man, and what he had done to the office of the president. Everybody in this room is grateful for that. All of us that worked for him and the honor of working with him are grateful for his service. And I believe that a the American people and generations yet unborn of the American people will express that same gratitude, President Ford. Rest in peace, Mr. President. Yes, rest in peace. What was the relationship between Vice President Ford and President Nixon? There's a question about the relationship between President Ford and Vice President. The, the Vice Presidency is, of President Ford is a short period. It begins on December 7, 1973, and ends on October, uh, August 8, 1974. So it spans a period roughly of eight months. <clears throat> It, it's, it's not a smooth ride. It's not a smooth ride. President Ford is, 
very early in his vice presidency is, is being cast as a poor man's uh, Spiro Agnew. He is to be the public defender of Richard Nixon and, Ward and all <coughs> Watergate-related matters <coughs> without any knowledge of it, and to make these bold type Agnew type statements that Agnew made before he res uh, resigned as the vice president. president uh, vice, the vice president, Vice President Ford told me of instances where he would go, he would be scheduled for a trip in Kansas to make a speech before some, some body uh, of people in Kansas uh, at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday, and he hadn't seen the speech. And he said, we'll give it to you on the plane. And he hadn't get it on the plane. He didn't get it in Kansas. He didn't get it when he walked in the building, and he got it during his introduction. And it was written by the White House staff of Nixon, and it's a, a bold defense of Richard Nixon without any evidentiary reason to do so. This guy, this guy who is a team player who is nominated by Richard Nixon in April of 74, in sort of the middle of his vice presidency, attends a cabinet meeting shortly after the disclosure of the smoking gun tape. And at the cabinet meeting, he asked to be heard. Richard Nixon has very structured cabinet meetings. You, you speak, you speak, you speak. No real debate, no conversation. He asked to be heard, and he said publicly at the cabinet meeting, I can no longer, I can no longer publicly support you, Mr. President, on matters of Watergate. Took a lot of guts. Took a lot of guts. Uh, he, uh, in later years, and Richard Nixon survived many years, and so did President Ford, uh, they had occasion to be together at, at funerals and at matters of that type, and uh, their relationship, I think, got a little better then. But during the vice president, it wasn't, it wasn't a warm vice presidency. Was there a long debate about the ethical issue of a pardon as opposed to the political issue? A long debate about what subjects are? The ethical issue of a pardon. It's a pardon? pardon? Yes. No, there's not a debate. Uh, I mean, this, is, this is a, it's not a group action. The, the Constitution leaves that entirely up to the President. The President had some conversation. There were a very limited number of people in the White House that had any knowledge of, the, of pardon consideration by President Ford. It was Al Haig, um, Phil Buchan, myself, Bob Hartman, and I think that's about it. I think that's about it. Um, I remember Bob, I remember Bob Hartman, who was an aide to President Ford in, in Congress and a very, very loyal guy. Bob Hartman, when, when they were discussing the possibility, the possibility of giving a pardon to Richard Nixon, Bob Hartman said, it is, it is September and it is an even number year. In two months, there's going to be a congressional election in November. If you give a pardon to Richard Nixon in September, it'll, it'll kill the party at the, the 74 congressional election uh, at the House and the Senate. I remember this like it was yesterday. I remember it's verbatim President Ford's words. He said, quote, too many decisions have been made in this office in the past five years based on politics. Whether I give a pardon to Richard Nixon or I don't give a pardon to Richard Nixon has nothing to do with politics. If I do it, it I'll do it because it's the right thing to do. I'll just shut him up. Thank you for the question. Uh, how did uh, President Ford react on a personal level, having this one day notice and apparently being on the outside of things, suddenly having to take all this responsibility and being responsible for the country? Well, <clears throat> President Ford never wanted to be president. He always wanted to be speaker. And uh, he's one of those s strange creatures in Washington, D.C. who didn't want to be president. Dude, the cab drivers want to be president in Washington, D.C. Uh, but uh, the, uh, he understood it. He understood uh, what had been pressed upon him, and he understood the responsibility of it. He, uh, he understood, before a lot of us did, that he was going to be president. 
he under Richard Nixon resigned in August of 74. By the time the smoking gun tapes came out, and Hugh Scott and Barry Goldwater, leading Republicans in the Senate, came to the White House and had a conference with Nixon, and Barry Goldwater on the White House lawn said, in answer to a reporter's question, what did you talk about and what did you tell him? Barry Goldwater said, I cannot stop an impeachment in the Senate. We don't have the votes to stop an impeachment. That's what I told him. And President Ford knew then that he was going to be uh, president one way or another, either as a result of an impeachment trial or as a result of a resignation. Of course, it, Nixon always maintained he would never resign until 24 hours before the resignation. But he, he was prepared for it. He was prepared for it, and uh, he, uh, I think he met the challenge very, very well. very well. What impact did the pardon have on the 76 loss to Carter, or do you think by then it was kind of overshadowed by other things like um, the Poland remark in the debate yeah. or, or you know, inflation, or was no Republican able to ever win after Watergate? Yeah. The, um, I have seen figures, you know, and you, know, you don't know how these, accurate these figures are. I have seen figures that said that uh, the pardon represented 5% of the vote against President Ford. Jimmy Carter picked up 5% of the vote because of the pardon. I don't know how accurate that is or not, but I've seen those figures. And uh, we talked about that. We talked about that in his retirement years. Um, and uh, he said that he would say the same thing if he were here today. He would say, I don't know if that's accurate or not. Jimmy Carter didn't play, play the pardon uh, as, a, as a campaign issue, uh, per se, and uh, uh, although it was not hidden, the, um, there, was, there was a strong feeling that the country was ready to change political parties in the White House, notwithstanding who the president occupant was. There was also, I will tell you this, my friend, there was also, and I used to see this almost daily, in the years 76 to 80, where there was a high inflation and high interest rates, you remember those years, and high unemployment during the Carter years, I, I would run into people as if they, oh, Benton, I'm so glad to see you, I've been looking for you. I wanted to tell you, as if it was a very personal matter, if Ford runs again in 80, I'm going to vote for him this time, even though I voted for Ford. I said, thank you very much, you know. And, uh, but lots and lots of people told me that. Uh, but. Um, I think it had some impact. I think it did. Uh, and I think um, I, I, spoke, uh, I spoke at a, a forum in, uh, in New York, and a uh, very well-educated group of people. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the people said, you know, Professor Becker, I, I read the papers, and I watch the news, and I'm fairly well-read, and I'm this and that. And he said, I never heard that story about the records, papers, and tapes. I don't know that Jerry Ford is responsible for preserving the records, papers, and tapes, that my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren can go into a record center for the rest of the, the, the continuation of this country and put on earphones and listen to Richard Nixon in the Oval Office. I didn't know Jerry Ford did that. I didn't know that there was some linkage between that and the pardon. I didn't know that. He said, I think maybe you people just didn't get that word out well enough. I said, maybe that's right. That could be right. That could be right. Uh, but, uh, you know, every time people go into the archives or some federal record center and they go sit down at those desks and they put on those earphones, you can plug in to any, rich, any of the Richard Nixon tapes and you can hear what's being said, the actual words. That is what President Ford used to call a treasure trove of American history. No one ever had that before. And he was not going to deny that to the American people. I think, I think that's a good way to end. Benton, thank you so much. Thank you.